Alrighty, um, I just started the recording. It's a few minutes after 10 o'clock. So we are going to get started this morning with the um, webinar on saltwater intrusion. So good morning, everyone. I'm Deborah Aller. I'm the Agricultural Stewardship Specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. I'm based in Riverhead, New York. Um, I'm helping Liz Camps moderate um, the webinar this morning, as well as giving a short presentation at the end. But we have three great speakers or four great speakers, I would say, um, this morning to talk about um, climate smart farming and saltwater intrusion and some adaptations you can do on your farm um, to improve resiliency. Um, so just a few housekeeping um, comments before we get started. So this is being run as a webinar. Your microphone and video are turned off. Um, at the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar, um, there's an option to raise your hand or um, just to write into the Q&A feature. So if I encourage everyone to use the mouse on their screen, if you're not familiar with Zoom, um, scroll down on the bottom, there should be a bar that pops up and you'll see different functions being a Q&A or a chat. Um, feel free at any time to answer, um, to ask questions or put something into the chat if you are having issues. If you cannot hear, um, any of the speakers or myself right now, make sure your volume settings on your computer are working properly. Um, and I see someone's already raising your, their hand. Um, if you could write your question into the chat right now, that would be great. Um, if I or any of the other um, speakers this morning unmute you as a panelist, you will be able, we will be able to hear everything. Um, your dog barking, your kid screaming, whatever it is. So just be aware of that. If we do unmute you, um, we can hear everything. Um, once again, if you're having technical issues, please put those into the chat function. If you have a question for speakers at any time, enter those into the Q&A feature. Um, and I think we will be holding all questions until the end of all the talks and have some type of hopefully lively discussion then. Um, Questions can be submitted anonymously, or you can choose to leave your name there depending on your comfort level. And again, this webinar is being recorded um, to be shared at a later time. And I think that's it. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Liz um, to introduce the speakers and the agenda this morning. Good morning, everyone, and I'm, I'm really excited to uh, be here today and, um, and have all the presenters. And I wanted to say thank you so much for Debbie for allowing us to host this webinar through uh, her Cornell system, their Zoom, uh, Cornell Zoom. And, um, and I also want to say thank you to Chris Miller. Have, we have to quiz this today. So it's Chris Miller and uh, Chris Schubert and Elizabeth Marks, because without them, we wouldn't be here. And uh, Elizabeth was the one that kind of well, approached me to do um, this webinar if I was willing to do a webinar for soft water intrusion. So I'm really glad that uh, all of them are able to do this uh, with, uh, for us today. And uh, while we're waiting for presentation to come up. Is it up? Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, can you see it, Liz? Okay. Yeah, because I have a different okay, system. It looks different for me, sorry. Okay. Um, so we have uh, co-sponsors today, like I mentioned um, before, we have USDA and RCS. I'm actually Liz, uh, my name is Liz Gounds first, and I work for NRCS, and my position is District Conservationist for Long Island and the five boroughs. So I cover the, the whole island and the city. Um, we also have uh, Chris, he's the Applied Materials Center in Cape, Cape May, New Jersey. He has done a lot of work uh, with us and he helps us to, he does a lot of experiments. So he's gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, we also have uh, Elizabeth Marks, she also works for USDA, but is also in the Northeast Climate Hub. And uh, we have Debbie for Cornell Extension in Suffolk County. And also we have uh, Chris Schubert with USGS. Um, and can we move forward. So today's presentation is gonna be about climate change trends over the last 120, 125 years in New York and how they are affecting Long Island, including groundwater. Um, and also why, would this, why these changes are occurring 
to us. Like now we are experiencing some issues with our wells and the soil water intrusion in the wells. And that's one of the things that we also are gonna discuss and what farmers and land managers can do about this. What can we do to make it better? Um, and then we're gonna have a QA and a at the end after all the, the, the presentations. You can still put your questions in the Q&A chat, like um, Debbie mentioned before, that you don't have to wait until the end to put them, but so just please uh, insert them in there. And that way we can start looking and answering your questions. Okay, so um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Hi everybody, I'm Elizabeth Marks. Um, and I think that when I present, um, I don't think you can see me on my video, um, but uh, I am a biologist with USDA NRCS. I've spent the last year on a special assignment working for the USDA Northeast Climate Hub, who is a co-sponsor today. So what I'm gonna talk to you today about is a little bit about climate change over the last century. Um, specifically what's happening in New York. Um, then I'm gonna turn it over for a little bit to Chris Schubert from USGS, who's gonna talk about how that's affecting groundwater. And I'm just gonna explain a little bit about why um, these changes are happening. So the information um, that I'm presenting comes from the Nor fourth National Climate Assessment. This is a 1500 page congressionally mandated report that's done every four years. The lead agency is NOAA, but many other partners um, contribute, including USDA. So if we look at the um, average global rise in temperature, um, it has been about two degrees Fahrenheit since 1880. Now you can see from this map that the temperature is not changing um, consistently throughout the globe. There are some areas um, such as the Northeast that is warming a little bit faster um, than other places. And you can even see um, a cooling section in the North Atlantic. But on average, it's been two degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we can see uh, differences as well when we look at the United States, the map of the United States. Um, and I find this map really interesting because you can see that in the Northeast, we are um, experiencing warmer temperatures, especially along the coastline. Um, and that is because the Gulf of Maine is one of the fastest warming oceans in the world. Um, there's a little bit of warming in the upper Midwest. You can see that hot spot around Utah and Colorado. Um, but yet in the Southeast, there's been a little bit of a cooling trend although that um, has been reversing as of late. But um, you can see Long Island, um, that's been warming at about a, a little bit higher than the uh, global average. With increased temperatures, we're also seeing changes in rainfall. Um, you can see from this map uh, that the Northeast is experiencing an increase in rainfall. Um, not so dramatically in New York along the coast, um, much more so in mountainous areas, um, but you are seeing an increase on the island um, and then upper or the mid section of the US um, has seen a big increase. Whereas other areas such as the Southwest has actually seen quite a bit of drying. Um, so we're finding that wet areas are getting wetter and dry areas are getting drier. So not only is there an increase in average rainfall, but that rainfall is coming in more extreme uh, storms. So this shows the percent increase in very high precipitation and um, very high precipitation is defined as over two inches of rainfall in a 24 hour period. And you can see the eastern part of the United States is really being affected by this, in particular, the Northeast. All right, so let's talk about what's happening at the state level. So the information uh, from this next section mainly comes from um, NOAA state climate summaries. Um, this is a great website. If you're looking for 
um, just a simple, easy to read fact sheet on how the climate is changing in each state. Um, these summaries also go into projections. I'm not gonna talk about uh, projections today, um, but uh, this, this will that provide that information. So you can download these fact sheets for each state um, with this website. So in New York, um, the average temperatures have increased two degrees Fahrenheit. Again, on Long Island, um, you're seeing a bit higher than that. Um, I think it's around three degrees. Um, the average rainfall has increased 15% since 1895. That's a little bit lower on the um, on Long Island um, as opposed to the rest of New York. There are some places in central New York that um, rainfall has increased by 25%. There's also been a 143% increase in the number of days where rainfall has exceeded two inches in a 24 hour period. Again, that's a little less on the island, but that's a pretty big increase. And that is something that is really challenging for farmers um, and landowners, um, you know, especially those so close to the water, that's gonna mean a lot more flooding. Um, we're experiencing warmer winters and increased rain, in, um, and that is leading to um, longer mud seasons. Um, if you think back to um, your childhood, if you grew up on the island, um, what were the winters like back then? Did you have snow um, in the winter time or for a longer period throughout the winter? And this is gonna really affect things like bare soil. So if you have a situation where um, in the past, the ground's been frozen in the winter, it's been covered by snow and now it's not, um, now it's um, not frozen all winter, that can have a big impact, especially if we get more rain um, on ero things like erosion or just um, wind erosion, water erosion, um, that bare soil is not as protected. And then finally, sea levels have risen 13 inches in New York since 1880. And that's higher than the global rise of eight inches. Um, and you might say, well, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> How can uh, sea level be rising in different uh, at different rates um, in different parts of the world. And this is, uh, they thought, they think, scientists are thinking that um, parts of the East Coast, including Long Island, is actually subsiding while the um, uh, sea level is also rising. So that accounts for the difference. So here's just some uh, graphs from um, these NOAA state summaries from New York. You can see our winter temperatures are getting a lot warmer. Um, it's also interesting to know that um, on average, our very hot days might even be a little bit less. This is probably due to increased cloud cover. I don't know if folks have noticed it's a lot more cloudy these days than maybe um, in the past, um, but that is probably why that is influencing this. Um, this number, this graph. Here's the observed annual precipitation increases. Um, so now we're looking at um, averages of 45 inches per year, as opposed to you know the 50s and 60s, where it was between 35, you know, and 38. And then here's the observed number of extreme precipitation events. Um, so I just wanna explain this back to this annual precipitation. You might think, all right, so it's good, we're getting more rain. Um, and one or two degree difference over the last 100 years might not seem like a lot, but this is not telling the whole story. Um, because what we're finding is that we have more extremes, more extreme rain events, um, more extreme temperatures. Um, I was talking to a farmer on Long Island a couple years ago who said, you know, our USDA hardiness zone is zone seven, but I can't plant zone seven plants because we get these extremes. Um, so 
keep in mind that what you're seeing are averages and they're not really taking into account these large extremes we're seeing. Um, and then here is a graph showing the observed and projected annual number of tidal floods. Now this is for Battery Park, but you can interpret this for Long Island. Um, and you can see that with the projection of sea level rise, um, the tidal flood number of days are expected to dramatically increase. Let's turn this next section over to um, Chris Schubert, uh, who will be just giving you some information on groundwater. Right, and Chris, thanks, thanks, uh, if you don't, oh sure, if you don't mind, um, just let me know and I'll advance the slides for you. Absolutely, perfect. Okay, why don't we just jump right into the next slide then. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, coastal groundwater and the ways in which it, it behaves and it responds to changing weather and changing climate, particularly with regard to uh, the saltiness of groundwater. Um, as I think a lot of folks already know, um, you know, coastal groundwater, here we're looking at a little cartoon kind of cutting across uh, the lower portion of Cape Cod, uh, which is not unlike the East End, especially the North Fork we have this lens of freshwater underlying, underlying the land that because it's less dense, it ultimately floats on top of uh, salty groundwater that extends underneath uh, the Cape or underneath the North Fork, if you will, at depth. It's, it's in many cases the same salty water we have in our surrounding bays and estuaries, um, although uh, you know it moves a little bit differently when it's got to go through the sediment there. Um, and that fresh water that floats on top of the salty groundwater is separated by a narrow zone, or, or we sometimes think of it as an interface of brackish water that separates the two. And those, uh, that interface will move generally fairly slowly over time in response to changes in the balance of inflows and outflows. Uh, you know, the main inflows are coming from precipitation and there's a natural outflow uh, that fresh groundwater helps maintain the salt balance of our, of our estuaries. But of course, we also take some of that fresh groundwater out of the system for human needs. So next slide, please. And so um, we talked a little bit about that interface moving. Um, there are a few ways that it can move. Um, a, a big way is drought, which removes, reduces the amount of that natural inflow to the groundwater system. Uh, another one, um, you know, more related to human activities is pumping, either pumping too much or pumping too close to that interface. Uh, one that we're, you know, increasingly trying to wrap our head around and, and try to understand and, and better anticipate is also the effects of sea level rise. And I'll, and I'll talk about that one a little bit more in a minute. Um, but the caveat with um, all of this is that um, kind of like the analogy of getting soap in the sponge, uh, once you get it in, uh, once you will contaminate a portion of the aquifer system with salt water, it's really slow to get it out. It's really slow to reverse it. So the key is to try to prevent it to the extent that you can in the first place. Next slide, please. So when we think about sea level rise, the elephant in the room obviously is the rising water levels in our, in our surrounding uh, water bodies. Uh, but because our groundwater system is in what we call hydraulic contact. It's really all part of the same um, water system. It's just expressed differently, whether it's under the ground or whether we may see a window into it in a, in a pond or in a lake. And so the possible effects on fresh groundwater of a rising sea level is that as sea level rises, the water table rises, particularly right along the coast. Um, not surprisingly, some of those windows into the water table, our streams, our wetlands, our ponds, those can also move upward and inland. Uh, any fixed infrastructure that uh, people put in, um, and examples of those are basements, septic tanks, and leach fields or leaching pools, they could be flooded if they're close enough to the pre-existing water table, which will then rise with sea level. And we're starting to see some of that in different parts of the region. Um, a less well uh, um, known or anticipated effect is that this interface with um, the salty groundwater also will rise with sea level rise. And I'll, I'll focus a little bit more on that um, in another couple of slides here. Uh, so next slide, please, Liz. 
So saltwater intrusion, um, you know, we've talked about it being slow to reverse and, um, you know, one of the best steps to deal with it is, is prevention where it can be prevented. And some of the ways where it can be minimized, and, so, and a lot of these are, are common sense, are water conservation and reuse, um, being able to more broadly distribute pumping demand, and that can be done either temporally, not concentrating it as much in a short period of time, but also spreading it out a little bit better spatially. Um, as was probably um, hinted at in the figure I showed earlier where we had some pumping wells drawing that interface into the well screen, repositioning um, supply wells away from the interface. Again, that can be both um, horizontally and also vertically, uh, perhaps going with a well that is located a little further away from shore or a well that is perhaps a little shallower, closer to the top of the water table. And I will um, kind of introduce my organization here a little. Um, you know, we are a neutral science provider. We have no developmental or regulatory authority that can assist all parties. Um, and I'm giving an example of that here in this picture where we are involved in a drilling program. Uh, this one is actually one that's been going on the last couple of years around Long Island to better identify where the freshwater saltwater interface is so that we can better um, manage for it in the future. So next slide, please. So um, one way in which we can try to help, and I have a little picture here of um, uh, an effort we had recently undertaken on Shelter Island with some landowners there, is to help measure groundwater conditions. Um, we can do that fairly easily without actually doing anything in, into the ground. Um, we call this kind of a non-invasive technique. Uh, we can you know, make do with some of the newer technology out there and we can look at things like um, you know, the, the water level, where the water table is. We can get some sense of the salt content of that groundwater um, with depth and also some understanding of the subsurface geology. Are we mainly dealing with a fairly productive sand and gravel aquifer or are we dealing more with thick layers of silt and clay, which are not gonna yield as much water? Um, I mentioned these non-invasive tools. They're really a regional tool. They don't give us such resolution that we can tell you really kind of where the air's foot, um, some of these transitions may be, but they could see, certainly tell us to the nearest five or 10 feet or so where we might anticipate brackish water or salty water. And one of the things that they, one of the ways these tools can be particularly attractive for landowners is they can help inform the best positions for siting future supply wells before those wells are drilled, um, recognizing that this is a fairly costly endeavor. Um, and we at USGS can also help integrate the information that we can get from working with our various partners to help map and identify where there are um, uh, fresh potable resources for future use. So next slide, please. Talk a little bit more about the tools here. Um, we may even have some folks on the call who have partnered this, with us on the past and they may recognize some of these pictures. Um, the, the tool in particular I'm, I'm kind of featuring here is one that we use to measure salt water content or salty content of groundwater. It's something that we can fairly readily deploy by hand over the course of a day. Power needs are met by batteries. And this tool is really just sending fairly sensitive signals into the earth using a single wire that we lay out onto the ground. Next slide. Um, here's an example, actually, some results we obtained from the uh, Halleckville uh, Museum Farm uh, not long ago. Um, I'm showing uh, these are kind of graphs looking down into the earth at the west end of the farm and the east end of the farm. So the, the white or the unshaded area up top is freshwater. Uh, the kind of the, the pinkish rose colored area at the bottom is salt water. And then there's a dashed line indicating that transition zone that interface between freshwater and salt water. Uh, I will point out that the, the tool that um, you know, we are able to make available um, is optimized to find salty groundwater. So it is ignoring other constituents in water if folks have concern about uh, anything uh, else that might be um, you know, underlying their property. And, and what the results are able to show is the estimated depths to brackish water and salt water. Again, these are um, probably to be taken to the nearest, say, five or 10 feet. Um, the depth range is a function of how widely the tool can be spread out. The broader of an area over which we can, we can lay this wire out, the deeper we can actually see into the earth. Uh, Liz, next slide, please. 
Um, and here's an example of where we've done that. I believe this is a farm on the North Fork. Uh, we can lay out a fairly large um, array of wires, you know, on the order of about 300 feet square or about 100 meters. We could see, I think, upwards of close to 1,000 feet down into the earth. So I'm just going to kind of wrap this up saying that the, this is an opportunity for no cost measurements for any interested parties. Uh, we can schedule these visits outside of the growing season and all the results are freely available. And uh, with the next slide, Liz, I think that's just our contact information if anyone would like to reach out to us. Um, the main investigator for this work is Fred Stum. I include his cell phone here. It's probably the best way to reach him uh, during the pandemic. You can also see his um, email address. And if you want to, you can also copy me or uh, I'm a good contact for broader questions about what are resources on Long Island. And so with that, thank you, Liz. Thanks, Chris. Uh, that, that is great. I'm just going to keep that up for a moment. Um, that is really great information. So nice to know that USGS provides that awesome service. So thank you. Um, I just, Chris, I'm sorry. Someone yeah. has a question asking about your equipment. What is the name of the, the equipment? Um, it's, it's called uh, TDEM is the abbreviation for it. It's got a, you know, Fancy name, time, domain, electromagnetic um, is what the TDM stands for. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions about it. Um, I don't know if Debbie wanted us to do that now or at the end, but um, I will stick around and answer questions. And again, folks can feel free to reach us at that contact info. Uh, um, so um, with that, um, Liz, Debbie, um, let me know how you want to proceed. Sure. Oh, yeah. no, we can answer questions at the end, but I want to make sure that one was answered so we wouldn't uh, omit it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Chris, there are, um, if you want to type directly into the Q&A, you should be able to pop that um, up at the bottom in the toolbar, and then you can type the answer right into that question there. So feel free to do that as well. Will do. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, anything else before we move on? Um, no. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. <laughs> So I just wanted to circle back a little bit about and explain why these changes are happening and just discuss climate change. Um, so many of you are probably familiar with the greenhouse effect, um, and that is when sunlight uh, comes through the atmosphere and hits the earth. Um, some of that sunlight is radiated back out into space and um, some of it is uh, trapped in this layer of greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide. Now, some of um, some greenhouse gases are actually very good. This is what makes Earth Earth, that we can regulate temperatures. Um, however, the problem is occurs is when that layer of greenhouse gases increases and starts trapping more heat. I like to think about this as the pickup truck effect, um, where you have a vehicle parked in the sun, you have sunlight um, coming through the windows that are all rolled up, and quickly the temperature within that cab starts to increase. So you've got this short wave energy coming in, that's radiated back out as long wave energy, and it cannot escape. So that's why that that how that heats up inside that cab, and then the greenhouse gases act um, as the glass in this scenario. So what are the greenhouse gases and where are they coming from in the US? Well, the top four greenhouse gases are water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Um, there's a couple more minor ones, um, but where they're coming from, the majority is transportation and electricity generation. 9% uh, comes from agriculture. So if we look at the concentrations of greenhouse gases over the last 2000 years for carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide, you can see that they've been pretty level for about 2000 years. There's been a little bit of fluctuations, but they've pretty much remained level until you get to the end of the 1800s. So what was happening at the end of the 1800s? Well, you have the beginning of the second industrial revolution. Um, electricity is invented, the automobile is invented, and we start taking carbon out of the earth in the form of oil and coal, burning it and putting it up into the atmosphere. 
And you can see around the 18, end of the 1800s, um, which is indicated by the pink line, uh, is, represents 1880, you see those greenhouse gases start to go, the levels start to go straight up. When we look over the last 800,000 years um, at carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, we know this information um, through, uh, we can get this through ice core data. You can see that uh, for 800,000 years, um, the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere never went above 300 parts per million. Uh, and then uh, about the 1950s, um, it went beyond, above 300 parts per million. So human beings have never existed above this um, 300 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we are currently at 413 um, and, and rising pretty rapidly. Um, you may want to just take a moment, pull out your smartphone, and just uh, search uh, carbon dioxide levels and the year that you were born, um, just to see how much they have raised uh, in your lifetime. And in fact, half of all human-related carbon dioxide emissions has occurred only in the last 40 years. Um, and temperature has risen along with the levels of greenhouse gases. So you can see um, that the um, the bar graph is the uh, car the concentration in carbon dioxide, and the gray line um, is, I believe, the in yeah the um, increase in temp in average temperature. So we've got this rising um, along with the uh, increase in concentrations. So we know why many areas, you know, why the earth is getting warmer because we've got this increase in this blanketing layer of greenhouse gases around earth, but why are many areas getting wetter? So it's this cycle where, um, you know, we have an increase in temperature that is going to increase uh, water evaporation. Warmer air holds more water, and then water vapor is a greenhouse gas, so that's trapping more heat. So you've got this cycle. Why does it seem like we have more extreme weather? Um, I think that's a big thing that I've noticed in my lifetime. Um, you know, we'll get I think last winter in um, where I live in upstate New York near Albany, we had a minus 10 degree day. And a few days later, we had a 60 degree day. Um, this winter has been very unusual because it's more like the winters I had as a kid where it, um, it got cold, there was snow, and those temperatures didn't vary uh, a whole lot. So, um, this winter, we've been in this 25 to 35 degree um, range for most of the winter, um, but that's been pretty unusual. Usually we're getting these extremes. Um, and scientists believe that this more extreme weather is happening because we have a wavier or an amplified jet stream. So we're getting those more, uh, feeling those more extremes. I think those extremes can also be reflected in the US billion dollar disaster events um, that this graph shows from 1980 to 2020. If you can see um, the last 10 years, um, what really jumps out is that severe storms are um, the cause of these US billion dollar disaster events, the majority cause. And in fact, there are more billion dollar disaster events from severe storms in the last 10 years than the previous 30 years combined. Um, and certainly this is due a little bit to, there's more people, we have more stuff, there's more impervious surfaces, but a lot of it is to these uh, more slower moving storms that are dumping a lot of rain. So um, with that, um, we can take one or two questions unless uh, we should wait until the end. But here is my contact information. Um, I do actually cover Long Island as a biologist, so get to 
visit with Liz and come down to see the great farms on Long Island every now and then. But any questions or comments? We don't have any at the moment. Okay. So I am going to stop sharing and uh, turn it over to Chris Miller. Thanks, Elizabeth. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, I'm putting up my slides now. Um, Okay, can everyone see my slides? Yes. Okay. All right, just, just in a way of a brief, a, a brief background um, or outline, I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the issues I've seen and problems I've seen with saltwater intrusion. And then I'm going to discuss potential, um, you know, amelioration strategies to, uh, to help uh, mitigate and adapt to the saltwater situation. And then I'm gonna provide a little bit of guidance and background and maybe um, make you think sort of big picture on some potential um, opportunities and maybe provide a little bit of hope for, for the future. So back in uh, 2012, the original plan came out, but it was updated in 2014, the NRCS and their vulnerability assessment plan for climate change indicated that obviously coastal storms were gonna increase in frequency and intensity and that you know, sea levels are obviously rising and, and gonna continue to rise over the next 40 or even more years based on um, you know, the CO2 in the atmosphere, which um, Elizabeth already had, had talked about. And some of the resulting impacts would be increased salinization of coastal areas, uh, increased flooding of marginal lands, obviously, uh, changes in plant adaptability. So we're seeing a migration of more Southern adaptive plants, uh, just generally just migrating North naturally, and also intentionally in some cases, because we feel that some of these Southern plants can actually help solve resource problems a little bit further North than what they used to exist. Uh, also, we see increased competition from weeds and invasive plants. Uh, for example, Phragmites is, well, it's always been pretty dominant, but it even seems more dominant in more recent years. And then I'm going to focus a little bit in this talk on soil health and soil health challenges because the same techniques we use to improve soil health on farms that are not affected by salt are also can be beneficial and used in farms that are impacted by salt. So NRCS, obviously it's the salt impacts is a resource concern with NRCS. You know, we see along coastal areas, we see shoreline erosion issues and soil and nutrients going into the waterway. Uh, salts also degrade soil quality um, and also water quality. As a matter of fact, um, the University of Maryland and some of the research they're, they've been doing in the last few years have identified that, that farm fields that have been impacted by saltwater flooding are actually releasing more nutrients uh, from the soil. So there's legacy phosphorus and nitrogen, primarily on the lower Eastern shore from, from poultry litter. And the saltwater intrusion is actually um, accelerating the release of those nutrients into, um, into the Chesapeake Bay. So with this whole issue of, um, you know, particularly in the Chesapeake Bay and the Delaware Bay and, and basically all our, our bays and uh, sounds here in the East Coast, trying to um, improve water quality, improve management on the land to, you know, to put, put in the right practices to, to catch nutrients in the form of buffers and things. But we, we have this insidious uh, chronic saltwater intrusion and flooding in some areas, some of the lower lying, uh, low elevation areas that are actually contributing to the water quality problem. So if we look at where, where traditionally where we, most of the salt in the soil, you know, impacts us, it's, it's out in the West and the Midwest. And um, it, it hasn't really been more until more recently that, um, that here in the East Coast, we're, you know, we're recognizing that this is also an issue here, but our conditions are actually a little more, more complicated than some of the issues out West, where basically they're, they're dealing with 
concentrations of salt in the soil from irrigation and from lack of rainfall. Here in the east, we have plenty of rainfall. Uh, rainfall can leach the salts through the soil profile, assuming that you know, there aren't any restrictive layers in the soil profile, which in some cases there are. Um, but we have the sort of the triple whammy of you know, having the coastal flooding over the land, so surface flooding of salt water, as well as salt in the groundwater, as Chris talked about. And also, if you're right along the coast in a high, highly saline um, area, you know, you can also get salt spray that impacts your, your crops. So we, we have those three things that, that are going against this, which makes, um, you know, which makes our situation a little bit more complex and a, a little bit harder to come up with some really good solutions in some cases. And it's really on a site by site basis. I also wanted to mention that the USDA Ag Research Service has a, a salinity lab in Riverside, California, which is about 80 miles east of Los Angeles in Southern California. And they, they have the charge, the primary charge within USDA to do um, you know, work on salt tolerant crops, to identify salt issues, to map salt. Um, and they're pretty much a one-stop shop. If you Google that, um, that facility, You'll come up with a lot of information, a lot of tables on uh, tolerances of crops, vegetable, primarily vegetable, tree nut, and uh, citrus crops. That's what they really focus on uh, to, to salt affected soils. However, keeping in mind that a lot of those crops that they deal with out west um, really don't tolerate our flooding issue or saturated soils. So that's again, what makes our situation a little more complex. Uh, a couple of years ago, the, Dr. Kate Tully at University of Maryland and some collaborators um, uh, came up with a paper or printed a paper, published a paper called The Invisible Flood, The Chemistry, Ecology, and Social Implications of Coastal Saltwater Intrusion. Uh, this is, was, was a sort of a, um, a summary of, of the issues that we're dealing with here in the East um, with, uh, with saltwater intrusion. And just to sort of summarize the, the elements of the paper that the drivers of saltwater problems are, of course, sea level rise, increased frequency of storms and tides. Uh, drought can exacerbate the salt issue as well as, as simulate the drought. So basically when a plant is exposed to salt, it, it, it basically um, has the same physiology response as um, being exposed to drought or lack of water because the salt actually draws the fresh water out of the plant tissue. Uh, water management issues, I'm gonna talk about those in a little bit and connectivity as far as um, drainage and uh, drainage ditches, canals, um, levees and things like that um, can some, sometimes actually exacerbate the problem. And then of course, we, we know what the effects are. We've seen these ghost forests of trees that are dying because of raised uh, groundwater levels and episodic salt events. And I already mentioned the species invasions and yield declines of crops, <clears throat> the eutrophication with nutrients going into the water, and of course, marsh migration. Um, basically, the marshes are migrating further inland due to sea level rise. I had the opportunity to attend an international saline agriculture conference in the Netherlands in September 2019. And it's interesting that they, they as you probably are aware, most of you are aware the, the extensive network of debt, levees and dikes in the Netherlands and how these, these things are really highly maintained to prevent woody plants from volunteering on them to destroy the integrity of the dikes. But these dikes and levees actually um, protect farmland as well as uh, infrastructure from, from surface flooding. However, they have, have a very insidious groundwater salt intrusion issue, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But it's interesting to note that they've recognized that tidal dunes and shorelines and tidal marshes and estuaries actually perform a better ecological service, ecosystem services actually, <clears throat> than these levees do. So they're strategically removing these dikes and levees in some areas to allow natural dunes and marshes to expand. So they're basically looking at the east coast of the United States and the Gulf Coast of the United States and saying, well, there's a lot of, a lot of advantages of having these dunes and shorelines and tidal marshes. 
and they provide the ecosystem services needed. So, but <clears throat> at the same time, these engineering marvels, so to speak, in the Netherlands, the, I think the last time they really had problems with, the, uh, with some of these levees were in, in the late 1950s, a very severe storm that, that hit the area. And since then, in some areas, they've actually been raising the elevation of these dikes and levees. And then in other areas, they're actually taking them out and putting in dunes and shorelines. So just to try to put some, uh, some sideboard, so to speak, on, on different stages of soil salinity and how a, uh, how a landowner could maybe respond to different levels of, of, of problem and coastal soil salinity based on how, how frequent they're impacted by the salt uh, with coastal flooding, how frequent they have salt in their groundwater or their irrigation water. And so we, this is a chart that we've taken from and developed uh, from a manual that we're developing for the Southeast uh, in cooperation with the Southeast Climate Hub trying to sort of um, identify different stages and, and what you could do or potentially do to mitigate and adapt at those various stages of, of salinity. Of course, stage zero obviously would be, um, would be no, no issues at all. And here I'll, I'll put my uh, pointer up just to show you. So, that, so the, the elevation of this slope here is kind of simulates while you're further inland or upslope you're not incurring any issues at stage zero. And then it goes all the way down to stage five, which is basically your, your subtitle marsh, your open water. And then, um, you know, if you're very frequently inundated, or if the marsh is migrating into your farm fields, you're at stage four. Uh, if you get <clears throat> um, a, a number of episodic events on a very frequent basis, you may, you may be in stage three where you have a low chronic um, salinity. Um, every once in a while, every, you know, maybe on a, on a two or four year basis, you get some sort of a, an event. Uh, you would be at stage two. Stage one would be a very, very large episodic event like Superstorm Sandy, for instance. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea. If you think about, if you're a landowner and you think about how common and how frequent the occurrence is and try to try to identify what stage you might be in, then we can help come up with some, um, you know, some guidance and some recommendations on what you might want to do to adapt or mitigate to that problem. Um, it seems to me that it really, since about 2012, after Superstorm Sandy is when we've been getting a lot of questions here at the Plant Materials Center, on how to handle um, these issues in farmland. Uh, this facility has worked with coastal plants primarily for dune and shoreline stabilization since 1965. But it's really in the last six years or so that we've, um, we, we've been uh, looking at this issue of how to assist our field office network and how to assist producers with coming up with solutions to, uh, to their problems with saltwater intrusion. Just, just some, some things that I've seen and noticed um, here in Southern New Jersey, there's a, there's a sod farm along the Delaware Bay, along the Delaware Bay marshes that, again, this damage is primarily from <clears throat> surface flow. So from flooding, not, not necessarily from groundwater in the, uh, in the irrigation, but from ditches and being right along the marsh there from, from surface flooding. Uh, down on the lower Eastern shore of Maryland, you see all the white crusting on these fields. I mean. These fields primarily are what I would consider stage four, and they're probably um, really ideal for, you know, for like a wetland easement of some kind in most cases, because the farmer has already tried to do some, some alternative crops and things, and the salt concentration is just too high in these particular fields to, to really uh, take care of the problem long term. Uh, in Eastern North Carolina, uh, visited some farms down there in 2019. Uh, on the left-hand side right here, you see um, a potato field where uh, the portion of the field is crusted with salt. It's been impacted by the, the flooding from the drainage ditch. So the, the, the uh, salt came up the drainage ditch and into the, um, into the farm field and affected the potato crop. So these, these areas in Eastern North Carolina actually uh, were once forested, so they're high organic soils. 
And these series of the networks of drainage systems were put in to help drain the fresh water, but now they're serving as conduits for the salt water to move in. Just a little bit about how different plants and plant groups um, respond to salt. So we have these group of plants called halophytes that actually take up salt and incorporate salt water into their tissue. So obviously they're not impacted by salt in the soil. And they actually exude excess salt on their glands. So obviously our, our tidal marsh plants like our Spartina cord grasses, our disticulus, the salt grass, the salicornia, the uh, glasswort is that succulent that you see growing in the marsh. These are all halophytes that actually take up salt water into, into their tissue and exude through their glands. So that's how they are adapted to salt. Other plants <clears throat> tolerate some soil salt and saltwater flooding, but they don't actually take up salt into their tissue. And it's typically those drought tolerant plants like our native warm season grasses that like switchgrass, coastal panic grass, eastern gamma grass that are very drought tolerant and, and do well under low, um, low nutrient and low soil water in the soil that also are adapted to salt because again, that <clears throat> salt sort of um, mimics drought to, to you know, as far as that, the plant physiology and how the plant uh, responds to it. Then there's other plants that will tolerate some soil salt, but they won't tolerate flooding. Uh, some of our turf grasses will tolerate a little bit of salt. Uh, some of our vegetable crops, particularly like asparagus, is very high salt tolerant, but again, it's not flood tolerant. <clears throat> Um, small grains like wheat and barley, particularly barley, has a, a high level of salt tolerance. It's sort of Sudan grass uh, are examples of cover crops that can be used uh, under a, a high saline soil. Um, and then other plants are just, they're adapted to salt spray, like our coastal, a lot of our coastal shrubs and trees like beach plum, bayberry, holly, have those waxy leaves that can tolerate salt spray. Um, Here's just an, uh, gives you a sort of relative uh, tolerances of some crops, some conventional crops, some alternative crops, and some of our restoration species that we primarily work here at the Plant Materials Center. It gives you an idea of where they, they fall in the range of, of salt tolerance. So the conventional crops, the potato, corn, tomato, you know, soybean, wheat and barley, um, you can see the varying levels of salt tolerance of those particular plants. Uh, most of them are in the low category. The wheat and barley are, you know, in medium to high category. Um, some of the alternative crops, again, uh, you know, the, there's been a, a salt tolerant soybean that's been, um, you know, genetically modified and actually bred for salt tolerance. Um, most soybeans aren't very salt tolerant. Uh, and then sorghum and, and canola and rapeseed are, are two other ones that have some salt tolerance, so a medium level of salt tolerance. Um, and then we have our restoration species, which are much, much higher in their tolerance to salt. Uh, the, the salt marsh hay, of course, being a halophyte itself, so it, it's obviously very high tolerance. And the switchgrass I just talked about. Just to give you an idea, I mean, this is just a, a shot from the lower eastern shore. So in a soybean field, you know, about 10 parts per thousand will certainly impact, you know, with flooding here, will impact the, uh, the soybean yield. Uh, ghost forest, again, very common in low elevation areas along the eastern shore, uh, southern New Jersey, uh, maybe even some areas of Long Island where with, with sea levels rising, it's not only the impact of salt with maybe episodic events like Superstorm Sandy, it's also the raised uh, freshwater level that these trees just aren't adapted to that amount of saturation. And then we have these localized areas of salt crust at, at 30, 30 parts per thousand. So basically you're looking at a halophyte would be the only thing that would be able to grow in here like a salicornia or like a, a Spartina patens. So we got these, these looking at what stage you might be in, you know, stage zero or one for conventional crops, stage two to three, uh, you're looking at maybe some alternative crops, like I just mentioned. And then of course, if you're a stage four or five, uh, you're gonna maybe have to consider doing some wetland easements uh, because you're probably not gonna be able to do 
any type of farming on that, those particular tracts of land. So when we talk about some strategies, uh, mitigate, I refer to mitigation as sort of a short-term solution. So after some sort of an episodic event where you might be able to be able to put, go out and put some amendments on, maybe some compost, maybe some gypsum. I'm gonna talk about some of those things in a minute. Um, whereas if you're, if you're in that stage three, two to three to four, um, you know, where you're going to, you're going to really need to adapt what you're doing, change up, um, some of the management strategies and, and change up maybe the, uh, conservation practices you're using, um, to, to be able to become more resilient, uh, you know, the salt issue. So just, I just wanted to show this. So the, the one stage where, we indicate that mitigation will work as stage one. So it's sporadic salinity. Uh, stage two, three, and four, um, well, two and three in particular, we're recommending, you know, that using these adaptation strategies, which I'm gonna mention, uh, and then four and five, obviously, you're looking at, you know, basically returning that area or allowing that area to return to, uh, to tidal marsh. Some short-term mitigation. Um, and again, this would be after, and most likely after some sort of an episodic event. So allowing the salts that might be in the soil short term to leach through either natural rainfall events. You know, we get a lot of um, a lot of rainfall in most cases with our hurricanes and nor'easters, which is fresh water. So, and, and often, oftentimes where we get flooding from salt water, it's it's basically diluted, you know, on the spot with all the fresh water inputs that that come down from the sky in, in the form of rainfall. But if we need to, you know, obviously you can irrigate with fresh water if you have the soil that, you know, that allows uh, for the hydraulic conductivity and an infiltration to allow for, um, it, you know, the water to leach through. And then maybe incorporating some rotations of salt tolerant uh, cover crops along with alternating with, um, you know, applying water. Um, gypsum has been, has been used primarily out west and in the Midwest. It's not quite as applicable in east, the east here because of the fact that we do have a lot of natural rainfall. We have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, highly um, conductive soils uh, and we, we don't necessarily have a, a high concentration of sodium on the exchange sites in, in many of our soils. Um, the way the way gypsum operates is that uh, it's calcium sulfate. So the calcium in the gypsum actually can replace the sodium on the exchange sites. And then, of course, you have to leach that sodium down below the root zone if you're going to be bumping that sodium off exchange sites. So um, sodium is actually toxic to most plants except for halophytes. So that's why sodium is a big problem. But um, again, the gypsum is not as effective in our you know, our soils here in the east, particularly if you're in the coastal plain or out on the barrier islands, you know, where we have very sandy soils with low CEC, you just don't have that much of the exchange sites occupied by sodium. So, um, so again, that could be this, this prop, this could be used um, sparingly, but it's not would be a widespread solution. Really, the best thing to do is to you know, use your field management to increase soil health. So by adding organic matter, preserving crop residues, adding compost, um, avoiding composts that have salts in them like poultry litter um, or manures that have um, salts in them like poultry litter and mushroom compost also contain salts. And then the option of growing some salt tolerant cover crops for a season uh, where, you know, you, again, you get the, um, you don't get the, the necessarily the, uh, the, the cover crops won't take up the salt, but they'll sort of dilute the salt with their root structures and with the residue that's left over after growing the cover crop. Chris, yeah. this is Elizabeth. Um, can you just go back and can you explain to folks what CEC, cation exchange capacity is um, and why that's important and how it's uh, challenging for folks with sandy soils? Okay, well, um, it, it's really based on what your clay and silt um, have exchange sites which allow nutrients to become attached, plant nutrients become attached to those exchange sites. Whereas in sandy soils, you don't have um, 
as, as a high of, of cation exchange capacity or those exchange sites. So obviously sandier soils don't hold as, as many nutrients as clayey or, or silty soils do. However, when you add organic matter, you're actually increasing the, uh, the number of exchange sites. So, so that's an advantage of having you know, organic matter as well as improving infiltration and um, you know, just improving the microbial activity of the soil uh, is beneficial to have organic matter. So, so if you're in a real clayey soil, you might have a lot of exchange sites, but you may not, you probably don't have a lot of um, infiltration capability. So there again, there, there's a reason why to add organic matter to, to those soils also, whether highly uh, clayey soils or on the other extreme, highly coarse textured, highly sandy, where uh, you want to try to improve the cation exchange as much as possible. Does that, does that answer the question you wanted answered, Elizabeth? Uh, I think so. If other people have um, other questions on CEC, just write them in the Q&A. So those are sort of quick fixes. Um, I mean, obviously the organic matter um, you know, increase is not a quick fix. It, it occurs over a period of time. Um, but definitely any type of residue that you can preserve on the surface will, will help um, reduce evaporation of the fresh, fresh water, allow for infiltration of the fresh water. So any salts that may be in the soil from any type of an event will be more readily leached, um, you know, into the soil profile. So some other more, um, I guess I call them adaptation strategies or longer term sort of strategies would be, um, well, looking at salt tolerant crops and, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about herbaceous uh, riparian buffers in a little bit. Um, and some of our crops, you know, they're, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what, uh, what I saw in the Netherlands um, as far as their screening of, uh, of common crops that they use in Europe. They're, um, those crops that have inherent um, uh, var various crop varieties have inherent um, tolerances to different levels of salt. So many of the many of the crops are not necessarily genetically improved or genetically bred to tolerate salt. Uh, one one you know one exception would be well I know there's been a lot of wheat breeding efforts to tolerate salt. There's been some barley breeding efforts. There's been some soybean. I think they're even looking at corn to try to get salt tolerant into that. But um, in a lot of cases. There are varieties already out there that have some inherent tolerances to, to various levels of salt that can be used. So it's a matter of investigating you know, those. Um, minimizing tillage, which is get, again, it's gonna preserve the residue on the surface. It's gonna increase soil organic matter over time, which is gonna help to dilute the salt, improve the microbial activity of the soil. Um, if your soils are, you know, are wet on the wet side, you might want to consider planting on raised beds. So, you know, forming raised beds and actually planting and getting that, that root zone a little higher. So, um, you know, so the roots aren't in, um, in deeper in the profile where there may be some, some salt under high, uh, high salt, high groundwater levels. And then we have a whole myriad of appropriate conservation practices that can be used and incorporated into your operations. Um, everything from cover crop to conservation cover, riparian buffers, uh, herbaceous and forest buffers, uh, forest and biomass plantings. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the biomass plantings and buffer plantings and shoreline erosion protection. And uh, one of our one of our, our main focuses right now and with the plant materials program and looking at some of our conservation practices are making sure that we have appropriate salt tolerant plants that are listed in these and are recommended in these various conservation practices. So our field office staff, our district staff can help, help landowners um, you know, with, with varying problems of salt water intrusion. And then uh, lastly, I just wanna talk a little bit about you know, some, maybe some alternative crops, some conservation plants that could be incorporated into your operation, which you might be able to get some uh, income off of. So just a little bit about uh, soil health. Again, soil health will help mitigate soil affected, uh, salt affected soils. Um, the, the main principles of, of soil health are minimizing soil disturbance, maximizing cover, soil cover, 
uh, throughout the year, uh, maximizing biodiversity. So you want you know, a mix of different species in there and maximizing living roots. And you can see there's a checkbox by each of our conservation practices there. And, and, and that identifies you know, which conservation practices address that particular uh, uh, you know, soil health principle. And um, I believe this is present in a, you know, I pulled this out of a tech note that the agency has on soil health. So it's readily available um, through NRCS. You know, increasing crop residue between rows or interceding cover crops between uh, rows of, of crops uh, to, again, to you know, keep weed pressure down, to uh, add organic matter, to decrease evaporation, um, and to increase infiltration, all, all helps ameliorate um, salt issues. And I saw a quote in one of the publications I was looking at is that salt loves bare soil. Um, so keep it covered. So if you keep it covered, you're less likely to have salt issues, you know, except under extreme conditions. We're talking about trying to make your soils a little bit more resilient before it becomes too, too harsh a situation to actually produce crops. In the Netherlands, as I mentioned, they, uh, they have shallow groundwater, there's salt, you know, pretty high in the soil profile. So what they try to do is they use minimum to no-till operations and they really try to do their best to conserve that fresh water or what they call sweet water on the surface of their, their fields. So they wanna sort of maintain that fresh water lens above the, the groundwater that's impacted by salt. And um, they have these network of drainage ditches that, that commonly grow up to Phragmites. It's interesting that they, they highly maintain these ditches. They, um, they actually cut that Phragmites, they bale it, and they actually use it for roof thatching. They use it for animal bedding. And I'm not sure, they may be even pelletizing it for, um, you know, for burning, for, for biomass uh, fuel. Um, so they're basically, they're, they're, that's how they manage their fields. They are very shallow tilling. They manage their ditches. They manage their, their dikes and levees, as I mentioned before. Uh, one of the farms that we visited, uh, you know, again, they're, they're looking at different levels of salt concentration and how it impacts different, uh, different crops. And note that, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, right here, this is a freshwater containment area. So they get a fair amount of rainfall there, just like we do here on the East Coast. Uh, so they actually catch the, the rainfall in a containment area or a lined pond, so to speak. And then they can pump that freshwater into this hut right here and mix it with the salt water that's coming out of the ground and it can actually apply different levels of salt concentration through drip irrigation at, to all these, um, these crops. So they, can, they have, you know, uh, I don't know, dozens of crops they're looking at and they can actually put on multiple applications of different concentrations of salt water and see what varieties that the, uh, that the plants are adapted to and what concentrations they're adapted to. Um, a little bit more about, I know this is kind of a busy slide, but just looking at, this is the open water here. This is our estuarine system, our tidal marshes. In a lot of cases, we have farm fields that are right up against, you know, these, these tidal marshes. I know in Southern New Jersey here, I'm sure probably in some areas of Long Island, down on the lower Eastern shore of Maryland and Delmarva Peninsula, down through uh, Eastern North Carolina, you know, so we basically truncated these, this natural buffer or even the managed buffer in that case um, between our wetland systems and our, you know, upland, terrestrial, cropland and, um, and our infrastructure. So, you know, what we really need to, to think about and expand upon, and I know the Chesapeake Bay program is really high on these multifunctional buffers. Uh, and we actually can actually, you know, in some cases manage these buffers to actually pull, pull nutrients out of the system, so to speak. Of course, natural buffers also have, uh, you know, provide ecosystem services and provide a lot of benefits. 
you know, here's a field down on Lower Eastern Shore where we have drainage ditch, um, you know, with, with Spartina and halophytes right next to a soybean field. So obviously under storm events, the, the, the salt water comes up these drainage ditches, they flood the fields and then the fields, the crops are actually impacted by, by salt. But if you have something like this, like a riparian buffer where you have a mix of grasses, there's primarily Eastern gamma grass in here and a little bit of switchgrass. Uh, the, the ditch is right along this road here. Uh, so whenever you have a storm event, basically the salt water floods the buffer, but doesn't flood the, the crop field. We did a study with ARS uh, out of the, the pasture um, systems lab at, at, at Penn State a few years ago. And um, it wasn't in it, we weren't looking at it from a salt tolerance standpoint. We we're looking at it from a fresh freshwater standpoint. But the three highest performing native warm season grasses in that study were the prairie cord grass, the switch grass, and the eastern gamma grass. And it so happens that those three grasses, which are the highest performing on a freshwater environment, also have varying levels of salt tolerance. So they can be used in an environment where, um, where salt is an issue also. It's all in the roots. It's all about the root dynamics, the root structure, the root type. These large roots here you see in Eastern gamma grass are called aranchyma, so they allow for oxygen exchange under saturated soil conditions. Um, these fine, finer fibrous roots, it's a switch grass, uh, you know, you are basically used for nutrient absorption and um, in water absorption also, but switchgrass will also develop more of these aranchyma roots if they're exposed, if the plants are exposed to more saturated soil conditions. And then we have the willow species that also, you know, are very tolerant of wet conditions and also have a, a very deep fibrous root network also. And this is just a, a slide of, um, Again, I think it's switchgrass on the left and willow on the right. And this, these roots were grown in a non-restrictive you know, PVC tube, but you notice the potential rooting uh, of these species is a, a, a approximately 12 feet, 12 feet deep in a, in a non-restrictive soil environment. So you can imagine what, you know, what kind of nutrients and, and additions of organic matter to the soil profile and, and all those benefits of having a deep rooted plant and then absorbing the, the nutrients from the soil. Just as one example, there's a, there's a vineyard down here on the, on the K-May Peninsula on the Delaware Bay side. And um, looking at this aerial photo and knowing a little bit about uh, how, how this operator manages his vineyard, you know, obviously he's, he's preserved this uh, riparian forest buffer. So the Delaware Bay, so you're looking west at, towards the top of the photo, uh, the Delaware Bay, the, the open water is out there. So the prevailing winds from the north and northwest. So there's protection for, uh, from the winds for the vines with this riparian forest buffer. Um, there is a, uh, you know, there is a, a natural herbaceous and woody buffer along the, the tidal marsh here. And in fact, the operator tells me that in the areas where the switchgrass, which came in naturally and where the buffer is a little wider, he sees less, um, you know, effect of his vines from, from the salt water. Um, also, something I wanted to mention before that I forgot is so, so when plants are dormant, when they're not actively growing, when they're not actively putting, uh, taking up water, when they're not actively, um, you know, conducting photosynthesis, the plants are, are pretty resilient uh, and not affected by salt. So it's only really when the plants are actively growing that they're impacted by salt. So if you have a storm event in the wintertime when the plants are dormant, you know, by the time the plants start actively growing, uh, you know, the salt may not even be there anymore. It may have leached out of the system, either through the groundwater, into the groundwater, or through surface water. Um, this particular uh, this particular vineyard, um, they noticed that in eight, March, April, May, when the vines are taking up a lot of water, that it, they noticed that there is a little bit of um, effect from salt. Um, or if a storm comes in during that amount of that, that period of time from March, April, or May, when the vines are taking up most of the water, that they will get injury to, to the vines. 
Um, but where you have a buffer, it seems to be, you know, lessened. Um, also where there's, um, where there's salt spray and where there's more, a more open area, um, this, this particular person has a, a beach plum orchard, which he harvests the fruit off of and actually makes wine out of that. And he even promotes his, his wines, you know, from the standpoint that the salt spray actually imparts a, a unique taste to his wines. So he's actually looking at, you know, being in a salt environment as being a, a positive thing and actually uses it for marketing. So a little bit about opportunities. I know I'm kind of running out of time here. Um, I probably have maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, Liz, maybe you can let me know. Um, there was a researcher with NASA Langley in uh, Hampton Roads, Virginia, back in the 2008, 2010, when, the, when they were really looking at, um, uh, the focus was on biofuels and biofuel crops. And his, he made a comment and he gave a lot of presentations that our conventional wisdom is that salt water, saline incursions or seawater is disastrous for agriculture. And he looked at it from the other standpoint, from the opposite standpoint, that saline agriculture could be a viable to desirable alternative to conventional ag. Um, for example, that, that succulent plant you see growing in the, the tidal marsh, the glasswort or salicornia, which turns a brilliant red in the fall, uh, was actually used, it, it is being used in Europe on a small scale at this point, but, but increasing to create a renewable fuel that was actually used to, um, to, to fuel a flight from uh, United Arab Emirates to Amsterdam, Netherlands in January of 2019. So that aviation fuel was made primarily from this, this glasswort or salicornia plant which we have very commonly here on the East Coast also. Just an example, the restaurant industry also in the Netherlands has embraced uh, these salt, salty plants or halophytes. They use it as garnishes. Uh, the, it's a highly sought after, some of these plants, particularly the glasswort, is highly sought after in the restaurant industry. And somebody growing these plants has a, has a capability of getting anywhere from 30 to 35 thousand dollars from about two and a half acres uh, of growing these plants so again i you know i don't expect uh you, you producers that may be listening on the east coast here to totally change up your operation right away to you know to to address this but you know these things are coming people are thinking about it there's potential opportunities uh salt tolerant potato uh, they, they they really in the netherlands they're really focusing on the what they call these salt potatoes so basically it's potatoes that are growing in almost strictly salt water uh, or, so, or irrigated with salt water actually. So ju just to, I don't wanna talk about this chart a whole lot, but if you look at these two columns right here, so you got the crops, potato, carrot, onion, lettuce, cabbage, barley, you have the two columns where you're getting a 10% yield reduction where it says 90% yield and you're getting a 50% yield reduction uh, in, in this column. And these are the salt concentrations that give you that or that results in that particular yield reduction. And you notice that, for example, the, for the potato, the 927 gets a 10% yield reduction at a higher salinity concentration than some of these other varieties. So these are all inherent. Uh, none of these were bred, I don't believe, um, for being salt tolerant. These are, these are varieties that are commonly available. And they're just identifying that certain varieties of these different crops are, are more salt tolerant than others. So we have the opportunity to do that in the United States too. And I, and I, I suspect probably the um, ARS lab is doing that already. So it's basically natural selection. And that's the same thing we do in our plant materials program with conservation plants. We don't do any intentional breeding uh, for the plants that we work with. We do natural selection. We collect the plant in the wild, bring it back to the center, monitor it, tested in, in actual problem sites, and we determine which ones meet the criteria that we've you know, developed for that particular plant. And then select for that and then make that germplasm or make that seed or plant available to commercial growers who then produce it for, for, uh, you know, for, for sale and for projects. So some things that we worked with are, again, salt meadow cord grass or Spartina patens that can be used as a salt hay crop, used to be harvested from the marsh naturally, but because of sea level rise and because of the damage to the dikes and levees in most of the areas, you can't get in there with equipment. 
and it's destructive to the marsh, but there are opportunities for growers to actually grow these plants. Uh, biomass crops, like our native warm season grasses, like switchgrass, prairie cord, uh, coastal panic, and a seashore mallow, which is a flowering plant, which I'll mention, could all be grown for biomass. Um, <clears throat> the stem fibers are used, for, you know, could be used for burning, but they also could be used and pelletized for animal bedding, highly absorbent fibers. And then we have opportunities of growing coastal shrubs for shoreline erosion control applications, for, for cutting, for the floral industry. There's, there's a lot of opportunities. This just shows salt meadow uh, hay being harvested in, in, in its natural setting. Demand is still high for salt marsh hay, but you know, supply is low. Um, supply is low uh, you know, and, and because the, you know, farmers can't get into the marshes to, to harvest it anymore. So there's potential opportunities to plant it as actually a value added crop. And we can provide assistance with that. The one catch with this particular species is that it's, it's been planted vegetatively and not by seed. So we're looking at maybe some potential, you know, um, germplasm that actually produces some good viable seed, but it can produce anywhere from three and a half to six tons per acre of, of dry matter uh, as far as a harvest yield goes. So here's just a, a shot of some of our native warm season grasses that we work with for biomass production, for riparian buffers because they're deep rooted. Uh, they take up nutrients if the nutrients are there, but they don't need nutrients to survive. They're tolerant of, of uh, various levels of salt, which we're actually testing these plants to see what, what they are adapted to their uh, salt as far as their upper limit goes. This, for example, this is a switchgrass we actually collected in the upper Chesapeake Bay in freshwater, freshwater tidal. But we actually identified that it had some salt tolerance and we planted it in, in the back bay on a, on a dredge containment facility site with, with about 25 parts per thousand of salt and it, it didn't blink an eye. It, it kept, you know, it put on as much growth and, and, and survived just as well as it did in a freshwater environment. Again, natural selection. Uh, also looking at different native warm season grasses to <clears throat> maybe hold off the invasion of, uh, of Phragmites or other invasives. And again, some of our some of our native grasses, native warm season grasses, have a very good ability to, you know, prevent the reinvasion of sites that were maybe even treated with Phragmites or even, um, you know, planted a little bit upslope or inland of, of, the, of the Phragmites and actually prevented its spread. Seashore mallow is a flowering plant that the University of Delaware has been working with. It's adapted from, you know, Long Island all the way through the Gulf Coast, which has a uh, potential. Um, added, uh, you know, d uh, different products that can be used from it. The, oil, the seed contains a lot of oil that could be potentially used for, for a biodiesel. The stems could be, you know, ground and used for animal bedding or pelletized or burned. So there's a lot of value added um, products that could come from this particular plant. And it's also a, a, a great pollinator plant. And each, it's a perennial plant, but each individual flower only lasts one day. And it, it can self-pollinate as well as be insect pollinated. And we had some of these potted plants out in our hoop house this past summer, and it was unbelievable what the quantity and and uh, you know and frequency of the the visits by pollinator species were. And again, it can be seeded and planted with conventional farming equipment, and it could be planted in those areas in transition between you know the tidal marsh area and the upland field field crop area and it will also help uh you know prevent the reinvasion or the invasion i should say of phragmites and other invasives and here's the a demo field that was done in delaware um, back a few years ago and some some papers that came out of the there's usda Ag Research Service has a ag utilization uh, research lab in, in Peoria, Illinois, that looks at developing products from, from uh, alternative crops or specialty crops. Here's one paper looking at seashore mallow as a feedstock for, for biodiesel or ethanol production, or looking at it for, uh, you know, for uh, biodegradable absorbance in, in cat litter and, and oil absorbance and, and, and uh, bedding, uh, animal bedding. There's also been some effort in looking at some of these uh, saltwater, you know, plant annual plants that could be used in salads. Um, the, there's been ex experiments in making pasta out of them, 
also. So again, these are there's a small markets right now. They're localized markets right now. But as the problem increases and we got we got to deal with this more and more, we may have to look to say say some of the folks that, that are doing work in Europe and some of the things that they're doing over there and sort of change up how we're doing things here in the in the United States. Some agroforestry applications. So the, some of these coastal shrubs have application for you know harvesting the fruit, for instance, for creating jams and jellies like the beach plum. Uh, you know, harvesting the, the flowers uh, of, of ground cell for flower arrangements, for instance, or for bayberry, for making candles and for scents, you know. Um, and then, of course, we have our, you know, our, our willows, our dormant willows and viburnums and dogwoods that can be used for shoreline stabilization. Here's an example of using those dormant willows for stream bank stabilization. You, you cut them and harvest them when they're dormant. You, you lay the dormant stems in the ground, cover them up with soil, and they, they sprout. So at the Cape May Plant Materials Center, we, we basically begin the charge to test and select plants um, you know, for, for natural resource concerns, for solving natural resource concerns in coastal areas. So we've been studying these you know, conservation plants in 65 for their applicability in, in coastal plain conditions, whether they be you know, droughty conditions, sandy, salty, and low nutrient soils. And we are basically our service areas from, you know, from Cape Cod all the way down through the North Carolina. And we focus on shorelines and critical areas along the coast, as well as this, this newer issue of, of looking at saltwater intrusion in farmland. And we can provide materials to growers uh, and do trial plantings and do field evaluation plantings on some of these niche or specialty crops. Um, maybe beneficial to limited resource farmers for, you know, for developing new markets for stream bank and shoreline stabilization and biomass production and agroforestry. And we provide the, the starter germplasm, whether it's seed or plants to, you know, to commercial growers. And then we provide technical support and develop you know, production guidelines for those materials that we supply. So in summary, I'm finally, finally at the end here. Um, you know, saltwater intrusion will continue to, to affect significant areas of, of the Eastern Gulf Coast. Uh, we are continuing to investigate options for farmers that are dealing with saltwater intrusion. Um, you know, we're focusing on Cape Cod to Long Island to Southern New Jersey to the Delmarva Peninsula and all the way down through North Carolina, Eastern North Carolina, and trying to work more closely with, you know, NRCS and with district conservation planners, getting those appropriate recommendations into our field office tech guide for our conservation practices. And then at the same time, we're, you know, working with folks who are trying to develop the marketing and, and looking at the economics of growing some of these conservation plants as alternative crops and helping with maybe, you know, in the future developing markets for some of these materials. There's a, um, there's a, a group in North Carolina that's affiliated with North Carolina State University called the North Carolina uh, Biotechnology Center. And they're particularly interested in salt tolerant plants and trying to develop markets for, for those materials and they're particularly interested in the seashore mallow that I, I just mentioned a little bit ago. So with that, um, I'm done. And here's my contact information. And I would like to hear from producers if, you know, if they've figured out a way of handling their problem and uh, they have an innovative way of, you know, of, uh, of dealing with this and, and making their operations more uh, resilient, I'd really like to hear what, what some of the uh, you know, strategies are. Um, Chris, I have a question. Yes. And here, I have a question for you. So in the chat says, uh, with salt water in drainage network and rising water table, is that a role for installing tight gates and or pumping to keep salt out of the fields? Well, yes. Uh, yes, it's, it's engineering. I'm not an engineer. I know down in... Um, I think in some localized areas on the lower eastern shore of Maryland, and I know for sure down in eastern North Carolina, the district, the Hyde County Conservation District in eastern North Carolina actually has a program. They have a, I think they have a cost share program to actually install tide gates. The only problem is that the tide gates can also backfire from the standpoint that they will open up, you know, when, when storm events, you know, so they will come 
sometimes they were, if they were over top or, or, you know, somehow get um, destroyed or, uh, you know, the salt water can come in and then they can't, can't go out. The salt water can't leave. So I know this, I've heard some issues with tie gates that they need to be designed properly where they allow flow in both directions. Uh, you know, obviously they, you know, ideally you don't want the, the storm flow to come through, in, you know, to the inland areas. Uh, but if it does, then it has to be a way for the, that salt water to get back out again, um, or that'll concentrate, you know, potentially concentrate in, in, in further inland in fields. Exactly. I, we, we actually installed a, a decent amount here on Long Island after Sandy. We did a, a repair in dikes and everything you said is definitely what it goes. You have to allow the water go in and out, make sure, um, you know, provoking more um, flooding than you're trying to fix. So um, that's something yep. that if you have any questions, any of engin or in engineers can answer that question. So you can send me an email and we can talk about that. Okay, so I will stop sharing now and allow Debbie to come on. Thanks so much, Chris. Wow. Um, these have been great presentations so far. Um, lots of incredible information out there to share. So I'm going to be very brief in my comments because I think um, obviously Chris and Elizabeth and, and other Chris, um, double Chris's today, uh, did an excellent job of <laughs> sharing a lot of information um, there. And so hopefully you can see my screen and, and everyone can hear me, hear me all right. Um, and I just need to move yes, I this, I, I apologize. Um, great, okay. Um, so basically I'm not, I'm not gonna um, focus the next few minutes necessarily on saltwater intrusion specifically, but talking about um, some tools and resources that um, are available to, to producers, um, mainly in New York State, but um, I think throughout the Northeast in general and, and generally applicable to all farm operations. Um, so as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm with Cornell Cooperative Extension, um, but I'm also a member of the Cornell Climate Smart Farming Extension team. So I'm gonna be talking about the resources available to you um, through the Climate Smart Farming Program. Um, so obviously I'm not going to touch upon what climate change is, whether you believe in it or not, um, and, and greenhouse gases, but everyone here today uh, is well aware of the additional challenges that farmers are facing. Um, these are just some pictures uh, directly from Long Island, um, flooded fields, you know, drought spells. We went three months without a drop of rain this past summer on Long Island, and that was very stressful. Um, lots of wind and, and water erosion when we did get rain. Um, and we have increases in, in pests and diseases. One of the, the newest um, pests coming to agriculture on Long Island, unfortunately, is the um, spotted lantern fly. And I'm sure a lot of farmers in the area have heard about that and, and that's of great concern. Um, so how to handle all these new, new species um, entering our, our environment, our agricultural system. And so climate, um, the Cornell Climate Smart Farming Program takes this idea of climate smart agriculture, which is um, a, a concept really tied in with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the, of the UN, um, which focuses on adaptation, mitigation, how can we um, increase agricultural productivity globally um, and improve incomes and livelihoods for people all over the world. So that's really kind of the motivation behind this local effort of, of climate smart farming within New York State and, and the Northeast as well. So the program at Cornell specifically started in 2013. Um, the extension team itself started in 2015. And I've jumped on as a representative from Long Island um, just this past year. So I haven't been a part of the, the, the team for very long but there are lots of great resources there for farmers um, and it's applicable no matter where you farm. And it's really all about providing resources and tools for farmers to increase the resiliency and the sustainability of their agricultural system. And we all know it's a system and it's all about integrating multiple practices um, and not just you know, the farming aspect, the ecology, um, 
and in the social side of things as well. Um, so we integrate not just research, um, but tying in with partners like N NRCS um, and Cornell faculty as well, leading field days and, and outreach events um, and also teaching. So I've provided the, the link to the website here um, if folks would like to explore it um, a little bit, climatesmartfarming.org. So the overall goals of the program, as I uh, already said, is how can we assist farmers with, ad with adapting to um, this climatic variability, these extreme weather events. So it's no longer thinking about managing for the average, but how can we manage for these extremes, these droughts and floods, often, you know, maybe weeks apart um, or months apart. And mitigating, are there practices we can assist farmers with to actually contribute to mitigating climate change? Um, one of the big things moving forward, there's a lot of discussion on, um, whether as a farmer you've heard about it or not, is, is biochar. And I know NRCS is a new standard integrated into actually building carbon back in our soil. So can we remove carbon from the atmosphere and store it long-term back in our soils? Um, and obviously, as, as Chris had mentioned, um, with um, building carbon and building organic matter in soils. This helps with a host of other um, properties and, and functioning overall of any agricultural system. And generally we're talking about um, increasing production, increasing incomes, increasing sustainability of farming operations on Long Island, New Jersey, everywhere. If you're a farmer in, in New York State, these are some of the members or the members of the, the Climate Smart Farming Extension team. We have representatives from various parts of the state and there should be an X around Ithaca as well because there are a lot of faculty there involved with this program as well. Um, everyone brings a different uh, level of expertise to their table. We have crop advisors, soil scientists, um, vegetable growers, um, people working in, in field crops and, and everything. So lots of um, people available to, to assist if you have questions about increasing, um, you know, what can you do to increase resiliency on your farm? Um, how can you help, you know, strategies to adapt? On, on the website, climatesmartfarming.org, as I mentioned, there are resources and best management practices for farmers, everything from how can you do an energy audit on your farm to, to save money if, if you have greenhouses or things like that, um, different methods of irrigation, drip irrigation, um, you know, how can I integrate soil health more into my operation? How can I be more efficient with my nitrogen fertilizer or using manure and compost and a lot of these other things um, already mentioned today. Um, one of the more interesting things that we provide growers is these, these tools that are available. Um, everything from growing degree days to a water deficit calculator um, to various degrees of potential for freeze risk and, and other things. So one of the most useful tools for farmers that have been found is this growing degree day calculator. So Many, many crops grow based on this, um, the number of growing degree days or they reach a certain point. For example, like corn, how many growing degree days does it need to, to reach silking? And a grower may ask, um, is my crop going to be ready before the first harvest? Will I be able to get my crop out of the field before there's a potential freeze date? So I threw in um, Riverhead here, but you can edit any location you are, no matter where you farm. Um, how many growing degree days you use as a base for that crop. And it gives you what um, would be the quote unquote normal and then the past average for 15 years and kind of the variability, these black lines that could um, be seen. These blue little bars popping up are the observed um, and predicted or predicted so far based on previous year's data. Um, the, the likelihood of having um, a, a freeze, freeze risk for a crop. So it, it helps to be a predictive tool for farmers and, and useful in thinking about when you, know, you need to get your crop in the ground and when you need to get that crop out of the field. Another one that a lot of growers have found useful is um, this winter cover crop scheduler. Um, USDA or you know, NRCS, every um, uh, extension, the extension service, every kind of service provider 
recommends cover crops and, and farmers really, they understand the importance of, of, of cover crops, whether you're planting a summer cover crop, um, when you're leaving a field fallow or before a late season planting, or you're planting a winter cover crop to keep that living um, root in the ground all year round. So this tool will give you an idea for whatever location, again, you, you input the likelihood that that in this case, winter cover crop, and here I've selected rye, but there are other options for different types of cover crops to select. What's the probability that cover crop will get established and then um, be, you know, survive or come back in the spring and, and protect the soil over winter? Um, soil loss from erosion, particularly over the winter, is, is um, a big issue especially in our coastal environments where we constantly have a, have a breeze. Um, so, you know, a place like Riverhead and on Long Island where we have a different plant hardiness no zone and, and weather than Northern New York or other parts of the Northeast, we're able to plant that, that winter cover crop much later into the year than someone up in, in Ithaca or, um, up in Watertown, in New York, in various places. So this is very useful in, in guiding decisions about when you can get, what's the last possible day I could get that cover crop in the ground and um, have a sufficient biomass for it to overwinter. Um, we also provide growers with, there are tons of videos up there. We recently just held a webinar on um, solar farming throughout New York State. Um, we had almost 300 people on that webinar. It's a very important conversation, um, an active conversation for farmers right now. Um, so you can access those recordings. There are other videos about other, other farms throughout the state that are um, what practices they are implementing on their operation to increase this resiliency and um, their ability to adapt to, to climate fluctuations. Um, last thing, we have the resources up there, the, the USDA adaption resources for ag um, geared to um, the, the Northeast. And I'm not going to um, take time to discuss this, but just realize that's available um, for growers on that, on that site. I'm going to skip this. These are, these are largely eight strategies um, and, and approaches for, for farmers um, generally. Um, to, to think about and to use, but I wanted to spend a minute talking about these six key strategies, which um, the, the Climate Smart Farming team, and I think many researchers and extension educators be, um, view as six critical strategies that farmers can do on, on their operation to, to withstand these extreme events and, and this greater variability everyone is seeing. Um, one of the most important things which um, both Elizabeth and Chris mentioned is this idea of focusing on soil health. Um, soil is the foundation, no matter what crop you grow, maybe unless you do hydroponics or something like that, but we're talking about field production here. Um, it, it, um, it creates a more resilient environment for, for roots and, and for plants and, and microbial, um, all the microbes, because soil is a living system. So that's critical when you think about, and I think as we continue um, forward with agriculture, the conversation around soil health is only going to continue to grow. And this is many, many practices, not just from, from adding uh, compost or, or manure, but rotating crops, diversifying your system, um, leaving living roots on the ground all year round, reducing your tillage. It's, it's a number of practices. Um, thinking about how to increase the efficiency of water resources on your farm. Um, is there a potential to shift from overhead irrigation where you're losing water to, to evaporation to some type of, of drip irrigation or something where the evaporation um, is, is decreased and you're more efficiently using that water that's available to you. Integrating um, IPM or integrated pest management practices. Um, this is critical and, and using uh, scouting your farm. Um, how can you cut back on, on pesticide sprays and um, using um, pollinators or, or biocontrols, more bio-based products. So, so integrating various um, aspects of, of, of pest management and disease management as well. And a lot with farm resiliency is around diversification. And I think 
Chris touched upon this, this greatly is um, what can you do to, to diversify your operation, knowing that potentially one crop may fail um, if something happens, do you have another crop that's going to be there to as a source of income to withstand um, whatever kind of potentially disaster to may come? If you have livestock on your farm, and there are farmers here that that have have live or sorry farmers on Long Island that do have livestock, um, obviously dairies and, and livestock production upstate is is a lot greater. But there are farms on Long Island um, with livestock, so thinking about stressors um, around your animal production and their resiliency to, to extreme temperatures or what you can do to create a more favorable environment for them. Um, the last thing is engaging in overall farm management and, and this you know, holistic idea of a farm. Um, it's not just the crops and not just the livestock, but it's the overall picture. It's the entire um, farm system. And what management strategies do you have as a, within your farm plan to, to help adapt to, to climate um, extremes. Um, so just wrap up here. Overall, we all know climate change or um, changes in weather patterns are affecting farms in New York and it, it's going to continue into the future. So how can you as a farmer um, or even as an extension agent in assisting farmers with um, adapting to, um, to these fluctuations in weather um, how can you increase the resiliency and minimize these, these potential impacts on your farm? And I've just listed um, a few there that, that I have already mentioned previously. So I won't mention again. Um, for those that don't know me, oh, I forgot to put my email address there. I apologize. Uh, I'll throw that up into the chat. Um, I, I don't know why I, I wrote that there, but might have been late for making this presentation. So I'll put that in the chat. and. Thanks, and I'll put it back to Liz and go into q and I guess. So we have uh, one question for you, and is does Cornell have a climate smart for forestry? Like a website, you're muted. I apologize, I'm trying to get out of that. Um, there are, not specifically for forestry, but there are resources on that, um, on our website that have information for forest managers and agroforestry. So um, if that individual sends me an email and I'll throw up my email into the chat now, um, I'd be happy to provide them with some information or connect them with someone who is more on the forestry side of things and can provide them with assistance. Okay, and uh, also USDA has the climate hubs that you can find information about forestry in there. And, um, I think that's that's it. We don't have more questions. Do any uh, one want to add anything? Any yeah, other I think questions? a lot of a lot of questions were already answered. Yeah, they were. Can people un, um, raise their hand to be unmuted if they want to ask a question? Yes. Yeah, so at the bottom of the screen, everyone, there should be a raise hand option if you select that and would like to, to speak um, instead of typing a question in, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, I also want to mention that um, Marjorie Kaplan, who is with New Jersey Extension, put a link to impacts of climate change on coastal forests in the Northeast. So that's that in the Q&A. I put it in the chat just in case someone cannot see the Q and A. All right, I think those are the questions. Um, I, Debbie and I, we can stay a little bit until the end just to make sure everybody um, leaves. Someone did raise a hand, so I'm gonna okay. unmute them. Um, so Will, I'm gonna allow you to talk, just letting you know. Okay, you should be there to ask your question. He's muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. So I'm planning on moving to uh, the North Fork, possibly the South Fork of Long Island, and currently live in Nassau County, inland, not near the water. Any uh, things I should pay attention to finding a property that's 
Um, not going to be affected by salt, salt water. Debbie, do you want to answer that one? That, that's a really, a really good question. I think one of the things is um, to consider is it depends on, on what crops you're growing, growing and, and what, you, what type of farm operation do you, do you plan to have? Um, I think that would, that, may, that would definitely affect where you want to think about having an operation. Yeah, just, um, a, small, just a small farm, um, just for myself and maybe a few households. And then um, also considering the well. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think Chris Schubert can probably speak to the well uh, situation. If you are um, uh, thinking about planning a farm, up, um, some type of operation, I'd just get in touch with myself and, and Liz after this fact, after this webinar, and we can assist you in, in providing recommendations for for what you're thinking about. And I would echo that um, as far as trying to gain some insight into um, how thick the freshwater lens is at the locations you're considering. I mean, land surface sometimes can be a quick and dirty um, proxy for that, but we have a variety of available resources. So if you want to email me, I can, I can connect you with those resources. Sounds good. Thank you. I put um, Debbie's email and my email in the, in the chat in case that you um, have any questions, you can send us an email like if Debbie mentioned it. Um, do we have any more questions? Any more? Um, um, I have a question for Chris Miller, just to, to, to keep a discussion going here. I'm, I'm very intrigued by all the work um, that's being done in, in Europe and the Netherlands in, in particular. Um, do, do you feel like they are more advanced uh, in the conversation around you know, salt, water, salt water impacts on, on crops there? And can we take advantage of a lot of what they're already doing there for our agricultural production, especially in coastal environments? Well, um, yeah, I guess, they, they, the Netherlands is, um, they seem to be a hot spot right now for looking at, you know, the different crop tolerances, you know, um, and they're actually sharing a lot of their information with the Middle East, the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, like, uh, I know they have projects with Bangladesh, um, I think maybe Vietnam, United Arab Emirates, and again, their, their, um, their concern there is, um, you know, is shallow salt impacted groundwater that they're dealing with and, and irrigation of, um, you know, of, of salt water on crops. I mean, I, you know, our, our USDA ARS salinity lab in California, I, I guess is doing, doing similar things. Um, I guess I just didn't get as, I, I've been to the Riverside, California facility, but only for a meeting, not to really look at what's going on in the field. But I, I had the opportunity in the Netherlands to actually go in the field and see some of the things that they're doing there. So maybe that's why I have a little bit of a bias. Uh, I'm sure the ARS Salinity Lab in California is doing, you know, very, very similar sorts of things. So I, I would look at both of those um, facilities as being or both of those areas as being resources. Um, there's a there's a group in the Netherlands called the Salt Farm Foundation, and uh, it's a nonprofit, actually, that's doing a lot of this work. Uh, and they get grants from various governments. Um, they get money from other, the European Union actually contributes money to this group um, from, you know, Norway and Germany and, and Sweden and, um, you know, and other countries there, uh, Belgium. <clears throat> and um, so anyway, it was just very interesting to see, you know, what they were doing. But like I said, the ARS Salinity Lab uh, is doing similar type stuff. If we don't have more questions, uh, well, thank you so much to everybody. All the speakers, you did a fantastic job and I, I really enjoyed all presentations. So I hope um, we get to do this again. <laughs> so thank you everybody for joining. And um, if you have any questions, please reach out to any of us. We'll be more than glad to answer questions.
Liz, I wanted to thank you for initiating this webinar for folks on Long Island. So thanks for bringing us all together. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you for actually coming to me and asking me, because yeah. you remember from the past that I mentioned to her about soul intrusion problems that we had. So she was able to bring uh, all of us. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for everyone that joined. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Last so thing I will say is the recording will be available. We'll send the link out to, to all the attendees and it will be posted for, for later viewing as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Elizabeth. You're welcome. Nice meeting you. Yeah, nice to, to meet, meet you as well. We'll see you again. Yeah, definitely. Bye.